So, hi, my name is Isaac. Today I'm going to be giving the eponymous masterclass on the uh, paper one multiple choice from October, uh, November 2015. Um, so, okay. so, question one, you see a fairly, a fairly simple question. And the key thing here is just to understand the relation to Mr. Conley. Uh, it's an economy of government uh, and the allowing free market as well. Uh, the other extreme would be a control economy. Uh, we just have the government providing goods and services, and the opposite is a pure market. Uh, those are the two extremes, and this economy sits in the middle. Um, if we go through the questions here, every uh, options here, you've got bus services, petrol stations, street lights, and toll bridges. Uh, in a mixed economy, uh, all of these would be provided. Uh, but in a pure market economy, you wouldn't. Street lights, simply because they are um, they're a public good, it's a definition of public good, something that's not rival risk in consumption and uh, not excludable in provision, uh, aren't provided in market economies because of the free rider problem. Uh, and therefore, street lights are the only one that we see in the mixed economy, but not in a pure market economy. So, a nice simple question based on the definition of the two economies and public good. Uh, moving on to question two, uh, we have a nice PPF diagram. Uh, question where the economy produces A, B, Z, and Y, and produces its PPF. Uh, so it's producing uh, over A, 800 good Y. And then if you have tracked it along, you get to uh, about 400 um, over there of good X, so that's what they're producing. And it's asking what quantity of good X can come. So if they only produce good X, they produce 2,000 good Y and 0 good Y. But because they're producing 800 good Y, they can only produce 400 good X. Therefore, they're giving up 1,600 of good X to produce that of good number of units of good Y. And the answer is that's a D. Moving on to question three. Um, in the diagram here, you can see you've got this economy, uh, another PPF. Um, GH is the original one, and you've got a shift into GK. And in which the uh, shift inwards with PPF is caused by a reduction in the production capacity of the economy, so that all goods can basically be produced to a lesser extent. Uh, so we need something that's going to be that every good in the economy, uh, you can't produce as much. Uh, and what's going to be the answer here is net output migration, as if you're losing workers in the economy, then you're not going to be able to produce as many of the goods. Uh, Quite simple, quite simple shift in this. Question number four. So we've got uh, a classic question. Uh, I to be positive and negative statements. So positive statements are statements of fact. Um, normative statements are statements of opinion. Uh, an easy way of kind of working out whether a statement is normative is it often a good statement like should or would be wise to or something like that. So what we're having here is a Situation where we have the rest of the statements on it among young people in Spain is 56.1% on June, the statement of fact, so it's positive. He found it from Spain should be reduced as a statement of opinion, policy position, and that's a normative statement. So yes, it's, it's, it's worth learning the definitions of positive uh, statements and normative statements and just some examples of each. These questions come up often and they're just a really easy way of getting on. Uh, here we have a government policy where they're trying to increase the sales of cars um, by offering consumers 3,000 if they scrapped any car over 10 years old in one year uh, to induce customers to kind of to, to, to buy cars. So what they're doing is just simply increasing demand um, because the, it's, not, it's not based on a price change, simply giving them money. If it was based on a price change, then you'd have shifted on the demand curve. But because it's a whole movement of demand at the price level, because they're offering flat rates uh, to encourage people to buy the car, the demand curve simply shifts out to the right. Um, Question. Good X and good Y and good Z. So, so when we have a, a uh, joint goods and joint supply, they're supplied basically together. The production of one causes the production of the other. Uh, when an if you increase the supply of the X, uh, 
generally, um, you would say that, um, so if you basically, sorry, if you increase um, supply of, of, of goods, you generally be interested in increasing the price. However, the only example when this will happen is when the good has perfect price elasticity demand, because in that case, an increase in supply would, um, and a change in price would massively reduce, almost to zero, well, would reduce to zero the demand for that good. So the price would change. This is characterized on a diagram by a completely horizontal um, demand curve. Uh, so that if there's any price change, demand automatically plummets to zero. Um, the joint supply here is a direct way that I think the question, as, I, as you can see, relates to good X and the change of price of X. So you can find it more than Y elements. They're trying to trick you by mentioning joint supply there. Uh, okay, so quite a simple calculation, and it relies on you, your relies on knowledge of elasticity. So elasticity is a comparison of rates of change. Um, and the way to calculate that is the elastic definition here, as I've written in this note. So elasticity is equal to the percentage of change of quantity demanded, and that's divided by the percentage. So in this case, we have a change in quantity of one day is of uh, is attempted by 40,000, but now he's only decided to borrow 4,000, so a reduction of 1,000, which is 20% of the original sum of uh, 5,000. So we've got minus 20% of the top, and the increase in interest rates is 2%, which is 25% of the 8% of the year. So over 25, minus 20 over 25 is minus 0.8. Uh, so therefore, the answer C is the range of interest elasticity is between minus 0.8 and 0.2. Uh, the trick that they're trying to get here is the fact that uh, it's an interest rate change of 2%, uh, not an interest in the fact that you've got these interest rates and you've already got percentages can catch a few people out. Make sure you're realising, making sure all the time it's percentage change, um, not simply just uh, seeing the percentages in it. So really make sure you do the calculations accurately there. That's what's really key to, to getting this question right. Okay, moving on. So question eight. We have um, a question about um, supply curves with a short run and aggregating individual supply curves. So here the thing they're trying to catch out on is the fact that you've got these individual supply curves and you have to get a short run on the supply curve. And the thing that is going to be held constant, so when you hold, you have to hold constant in the the industry, um, you have to hold constant prices of massive production, and you have to hold constant in the state of technology, you're not going to hold constant in the price of the product, that's going to vary between brands, and they're charging different uh, prices in the market. Additionally, when you increase the flow of food, I use the equity, the price is going to change to the Question nine. Um, in this diagram, we've got two supply, uh, two supply curves. Uh, we've got S1, and you clearly can see a shift in it to S2. This is an increase supply, a shift balance to the right, worth learning your directions there. Um, and this is going to be what you have to try and think about here. It's a reason why you'll get an increase of supply at every price level. So at the old price, you're now supplying quantity. And the reason for this would be it's going to increase in the price of substitute good, probably not. Um, the increase in profitability of supply X absolutely will not be simply because it's now profitable for each unit is more profitable for it's making more money off it. So you increase quantity of the price level uh, because every unit of the good is making more money. So even if the price falls, you're still going to produce as many because you're making more. Question number ten. Here the that's going to tell you about the, the shape of the supply curve. So if it has an industry, uh, the supply curve is always upsliding. So this is eliminating a number of the uh, other options. Um, and simply, you've also got an increase in demand. 
quite clearly that's the addition to the right uh, of the demand curve. Um, and the answer is A. The reason uh, for this, uh, the type of science is the competition, a change in, in price is going to impact on the quantity uh, demand and supply. Question number 11. Uh, this is quite a tricky question actually. Uh, the table shows the demand and supply uh, of peppers, and it tells you the equilibrium price is 15. As you can see, that's the point at which uh, supply equals demand. So when we have a subsidy, what occurs is that the government give uh, 10 cents per kilo to producers, thereby reducing the price of uh, kilo for producers. Uh, that means that the producers now want to supply. Um, are basically being paid uh, 25 uh, per kilo, essentially. So we want to make supply 19 uh, cents. Uh, however, clearly at this point, the, there's an excess in supply when the, when the price of kilo is 25. Um, there's 12 demand, so that's what we've got. So you need to come price in the middle, and you can see that the second delivery price is going to be where the price of kilo is 10, um, the suppliers are passing some of the subsidy onto the, consum onto the, uh, the consumers. So their demand a little bit more, their price is falling. At the same time, the consumers, can, the producers can afford to charge a lower price because there's a subsidy of uh, five cents of every uh, uh, kilo is uh, being given to. to and 10 cents per kilo to producers. So even though they're charging 10, um, they're effectively 20. So the price, you just work out the price that the, the, the suppliers are facing. Uh, the price when they're charging 10 cents, the price they're being given is the subsidy is 20. At that point, they have to buy 17. And since the price that the consumers are facing is 10, they want uh, demand 17, you've got equilibrium, demand for supply, therefore their price is 10 cents. Uh, a very tricky question for that. Um, I'm happy to go over that again if you've got specific questions, but the key information is the fact that uh, the price charged to consumers is lower than the original equilibrium price that the producers receive is higher because of the uh, subsidy. And the difference is 10 the same subsidy, that's why it's demand that the equilibrium will be around that price. Question 23. Uh, you have an 18th century pot maker here, uh, and they're selling 18 to more 12 and it's a pot maker. There are currently three pots in these pot makers. Uh, the diagram shows there's a million pots. Okay, so they each initially own pots. You can see here that the price base is 2,000, and they each own two pots, the same equilibrium. At this point, why is happy with those pots? It's more than equal to supply. Um, if the box the price two, so there's a market out there. At four, we can see that uh, DZ is not in equilibrium. Sorry, the price is 2000. Uh, DZ is not in equilibrium. They would rather have six blocks at this price. Uh, and then there's a market out there. The next one is X. Uh, there's a common, common uh, solution to this problem in this track. So, what you have is uh, Consumer X would um, sell some of their crops they don't put all in or two at this price to TZ, who get six at this price, and simply they sell each other. So at this market clearing price, 2000, and Z exists as a buyer, and X exists as a seller. Question 13 over here. So a fairly, a fairly nice question here about um, the European airline. You have a shift in supply from S1 to S2. Um, and this is a nice question, just isolating produced surplus. So it's worth understanding on a diagram uh, the definition of uh, where produced surplus is, and also its definition. So, producer surplus is the difference uh, between the price that consumers would be happy to supply the product for and the price which producers actually receive. So, here we can see originally uh, the price was G. So that's where S1 meets uh, demand in M. You have plus J, that's the point 
there is triangle here. So that's the difference between the price that some of the suppliers were happy to supply out all this piece here, this price is here, and the time is back there, goes to that area there. Now what you see is if the uh, supply curve shifts, you've got a new equilibrium here at N, where the price is H, uh, a new point here at K, where the quantity is supply is zero, that's the price none of them are willing to supply that. And the quantity of producers up us here is simply again that triangle H, K is N, or H, N, K. Nice uh, uniting of the uh, area which is surplus. Um, that's what uh, that and the opposite producer surplus. Being able to demonstrate those on diagrams is very useful when it comes to quite a lot of these and even this question. So, question 14. So this question is about external benefits and uh, externalities. Uh, external and externality for start is a uh, cost or benefit that occurs uh, in fact, an individual um, outside the initial outcome of exchange. So, whereas the market takes into account the producer and consumer, some economic actions, for example, what can you drive the betting in an area? Uh, being uh, supplied in Nigeria clearly does have an external benefit because if less people have malaria, then they don't get sick, then it's going to work, it's going to have an effect on uh, employers, etc. etc. So it's really it's really useful uh, to be able to account for external benefits as part of market failure, it's why malaria drugs probably aren't supplied as much as they should be. So here we're looking for the thing that least likes to have an external benefit. Um, so here, a new drug to prevent malaria in Nigeria is likely, as I said, to have external benefits. Uh, the granting of permission to develop a rural area in Bangladesh also likely to have external benefits. The imposition of a quota on fishing in the Atlantic Ocean also likely to have external benefits. They're all likely to affect people outside of the, the sole uh, kind of vacuum economic exchange that is supplier and consumer producer and consumer. So I think that nice. And the final one, D, the purchase of tickets to attend the Olympics in Brazil. Um, is also likely to have a nice, um, is, is, um, is not likely to have an external benefit. It could have an external benefit, but it's the least likely simply because when you're purchasing a ticket, um, the benefit is very much felt for the individual who's able to spend for the ticket and the money that the uh, cost of selling is all directed at the individual selling the ticket. It's kind of a very isolated exchange. So we're less likely to see external benefits there as we are in the other time. Um, again, it's important to think least likely it's not which of these doesn't have an external benefit. Obviously, there are cases when purchasing tickets to the system is least likely to have than the other example. So, here we're working with a process of elimination in order to kind of find out the right answer. Okay, uh, question 15. Um, we're looking here again, which statement is correct? So, again, we're looking for uh, sort of to eliminate, we're looking through. External cost is the sum of social cost and private cost. That's not true. Uh, the external cost is the sum of the social cost minus the private cost. That's the cost that is outside. Private costs usually larger than social costs. They can be, they're not always. Social costs are usually smaller than external costs. Again, not always. It depends on the exchange. Social cost is the sum of private costs and external costs. Social cost occurs when you take into the total cost affecting all individuals who can be impacted by the economic exchange. So that's the private individuals who are engaged in the economic exchange themselves and the external cost, the cost to the third parties. So therefore, D is the, is the correct statement. It relies on an understanding of the nature of externalities and the characteristics and definitions of external costs, private costs, and uh, social costs. And the same with the benefits. Social benefits is the sum of the private benefits and the external costs. Uh, question 16. The government has sufficient funds to pay for two transport projects. As choose between four projects, one of which is the same social cost of 200 million as a private cost, plus social cost. So the table shows the benefits for projects. So in all cases, you can see that the benefits exceed the costs, therefore, will be beneficial for government to engage in more. But which ones are the best? And what we're looking for is when the total benefit is the greatest. When you get the most value for money, you're getting um, social uh, as much. Uh, Total benefit as you are over the social, so social benefit, private benefit, external benefit over social cost. So you can see that in project one it's 120, 220, sorry, 220 million dollars. In project two it's 210 million dollars. Project three, uh, 210 again. And project four it is 230 million dollars. So you're going to choose the two with the highest, um, 
social benefits, and those are project one and project two. We also have a, uh, so here on question 17, uh, we we're thinking about like road tolls, um, so when you have to pay to use the road, and how uh, we can reduce traffic congestion is and what makes it more likely that it's going to be effective. So one of the things we look for is what's going to stop individuals driving on a road if the road becomes more expensive. And it's clear here that the answer is question C, because if the road becomes domestic, if you increase the, the cost of having to drive a car on the road by making individuals pay a toll to go on the road, then then um, by making it more expensive to have to go on the road, sorry, then um, if demand is elastic, demand is going to fall back. So you're not going to have people driving on the road because it's suddenly increased, the price is increased, and therefore um, individuals are going to, uh, you're going to reduce traffic congestion. Um, that's answer 17. Moving on to question 18, uh, we have a diagram um, of demand for, for an agricultural commodity. Um, unit has unitary elasticity. So unitary elasticity, and I'll show you the definition here, is when a uh, change in price of that good causes an equal change in the quantity of the market. So if you increase it by 10%, you get a 10% more price, or a 10% increase in price. So the majority of goods consume when price goes up, the market goes down. Um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, what we're looking at here is what the government should do to keep the total revenue of part of this question is total revenue. They're not asking you to think about incomes of the farmers, so based on their cost. They're asking you specifically to look at the um, total revenue, so the amount of money the farmers receive. The same. And in this case, the government don't want to actually intervene in the market. The minute the government intervenes in the market, it changes the amount of revenue. To keep total revenue the same, you need to allow the price of the commodity to be determined by the market. So it's if price or supply falls, price increases, and they're able to receive the same amount of money in for their goods as they were before. If supply increases, so it's producing S2, the price is lower, but it's selling more, and therefore the amount of revenue is a total revenue is price times per quantity. So imagine that you've got a supply curve, and you'll see my mouse here, going up between, at this equilibrium point here, where you have P and Q. You're selling Q amounts of goods, supplying Q amounts of goods for price P at equilibrium. If we move up to where S1 is, you can see we've now got a higher price, but obviously we're with less quantity. But the area of the rectangle there, the area here that supports the square and the area of the rectangle are going to be the same, as is the case here. If we have supply S2, you've got quantities more being greater, but price lower, so the area of that rectangle remains the same. And that's part of the nature of unitary elasticity. So the fact they've told you it's unitary elasticity tells you that you need to allow the price to be supplied to the quantity by the market, and that keeps this revenue, this area here, P by Q, the same. Oh, sorry. Right, question 19. You have uh, this line ML, this production possibility curve. Line MN is when they're able to trade. So what this shows here is that the economy has a The reason for this is, is comparative advantage occurs when an economy can produce a good at a lower uh, opportunity cost than it does when it has to sacrifice its yield. So here, though, if the economy was just operating in itself, it would have to sacrifice L amount of goods to produce. This naught to L amount of goods to produce good X. In this case, when you can trade, it can now like, produce good M, but gain more of good M because there's the... Um, production possibility frontier, as it were, is less steep. That shows that the economy has a prior advantage, and this is something I can explain in greater detail if you want to another stage. It's really, really important that you understand how to advantage of these questions, as the comparative advantage is the basis of trade in the economies. It's what provides justification for trade, and it's what explains why different countries specialize in certain types of goods 
in order that they can therefore gain more from trade. The gains of trade rely on them. So a group of people in the country are starting to come in free trade tariffs and costs imposed by the government of trade, and they believe it will benefit. So here is a simple question, just getting the concept not a highlight like this is not right. All of these are arguments in favour, arguments about free trade. They're all true about free trade, but one of them is obviously going to be a negative because they wouldn't want to campaign. It's the fact that it encourages the only competition between producers in different countries, that's clearly positive. It encourages global specialization and better product quality, a good thing. It gives consumers a greater choice of products in other countries, it's a good thing. And D, it lets countries dump cheap surplus products in other countries. That's not good. If countries dump cheap surplus products in other countries, so if European farmers are producing too many tomatoes and they're exporting them to um, Africa because they're at much cheaper cost because they're just left over products and they can undercut African suppliers, that's going to, uh, produ uh, the producers of tomatoes, that's definitely going to cause problems with domestic um, Domestic industries and African tomato farms go out of business, it's going to be a problem. So, when you start a campaign for free trade, you're unlikely to do that in your, um, in your campaign because it's actually a negative impact, a negative of free trade. Okay, so we've got um, question 21 now. So, here the table refers to the country. Um, here we have an uh, index of import prices between two periods of index of export prices. They've given you two years. Um, and what we're looking at is whether the balance of payments worsened, the balance of trade improved, the exchange rate appreciated. Now, not in the earlier three, we can't actually tell. We need any information, but we can tell that the terms of trade worsened. So the terms of trade, as we see from this definition, is the ratio of a country's export prices to import prices. And this is normally given as an index. And returns to trade get worse when the ratio of export prices to import prices gets high. So what we're seeing here is we have a ratio of 57 to 48 um, of export prices to import prices. And then in 2015, we've got a uh, ratio of uh, import prices to export prices comes in 22 to 2020. And you can see here, terms of trade worsened for the country. So the cost of imports became higher than the cost of exports. Uh, ratio and it got much worse. So that's simply a definition of understanding definition of terms of trade, understanding it wasn't I think in my definition there got a little bit the wrong way around, sorry. Uh, when it gets the ratio of export prices to import prices decreases, sorry, when the money you're going to your exports is less than the money you're going to have to spend on imports, the terms of trade are worse. I apologize for doing that more in my definition earlier. This relies on an understanding the question relies on understanding of terms of trade. And they're just assessing the ratios and data. And because, luckily, because the data flips, so at the beginning, export prices, the index is higher than import prices. In the latter years, 2015, uh, the index of import prices is higher than that of export prices. It's very clear to see the terms of trade worsen. There's no sophisticated calculations here. It's just a simple, simple comparison. Uh, we look at question 22. We have a foreign government paying a UK university educated students. How this should be recorded in the balance of payments, current account, the UK. So we can see it's an inflow. Well, the foreign government money is coming into the UK, uh, paying UK universities to educate their students. It's an inflow, it's an outflow. And it would be part of the trading services. So UK universities are providing a service, they're providing education uh, to these foreign governments. Therefore, those are the trade services. And it's a simple classification question, just important to make sure. You don't get caught out by inflows and outflows and trades and goods, trade services. Make sure on these questions you're making very clear uh, decisions and making sure your answers match those decisions. Uh, question 23. So what we see here is that during a recession, uh, there was a large fall in national output. Um, often that happens in a recession and you get increased unemployment. But the increase in unemployment here was much lower than expected. And what might have accounted for this? So, one of the things that might have accounted for this is that you have a decrease in labor productivity. Labor productivity is how effective and productive each individual worker is being. If your workers are being less productive, then you would pay them less. And also you'd have to employ more to produce uh, the same amount of national outputs. So if you had labor productivity remaining the same and you had to have unemployment, uh, you'll just cut jobs to um, 
compensate for performance that, you would get a massive rise in unemployment. If it's decreased labor activity, you would still cut jobs, you'll still increase unemployment, but clearly it'd be much lower than expected because you need more workers to do this, the amount of work. Um, but increasing the outward migration wouldn't have an impact on unemployment. Uh, it would mean more workers were staying in the country and that would actually increase unemployment more than, uh, rather than uh, mean it was higher than expected, lower than expected, a decrease in part-time working, is increased in the labour force, that would increase unemployment, and a decrease in the number of students means less people are staying in education and more people entering the labour force. That also means that you get, would have a, a greater increase in unemployment. The only answer that results in a lowering of expected unemployment would be a decrease in labour activity. So, 24. Uh, the diagram shows an economy's aggregate demand like supply curves. How are the curse likely to be affected by a natural disaster that destroys a large proportion of the economy's resources? So, when you have a large natural disaster, you're likely to see a decrease in demand and also supply. So, it's important to note that a natural disaster that's impacting the large portion of the economy's resources is going to impact both sides of the economy. So, you're going to get a shift to the left in demand and a shift to the left in supply, an overall decrease. So, the price level is probably likely to remain the same but you're also going to have a huge impact on output, and that's the effect of natural disasters. So it's important to understand that it's going to affect both sides of the economy. Okay, question 25, cost push inflation. Cost push inflation, so it's inflation caused by an increase in prices of the inputs in the economy. So we're looking at the things that the economy is using, capital, maybe labor, maybe raw materials, and building. Uh, their price of them increases, you get a full increase in the price of it. So imagine cars, you have to bring it, you have to use uh, various different products to build the car, uh, different food items to, to make meals, etc. Uh, when the price of those inputs increases, you get an increase in the overall price of the economy, and that's inflation. So if you have an increase in the price of imports, that's going to cause cost of inflation, and it's often the most likely cause. So when you're importing goods from another country and price levels in that country rise and imports become more expensive, the overall price level in your country is going to rise. And that's going to cause your cost push inflation. An increase in the rates of income tax is not going to cause cost push inflation. An increase in the money supply is likely to cause inflation, but not cost push inflation, so it's important to get this definition. And an increase in the exchange rate is also not likely to cause cost push inflation. In fact, an increase in the exchange is likely to make imports cheaper, so you'll actually get some cost push deflation. Disinflation. Consumer price index, sorry, question 26. Table shows consumer price index, CPI, consumer price index is just an indication of the price level of the economy done by calculating the change in a uh, price of uh, uh, the price of a uh, standardized parcel of goods changed every year. Sometimes you can few products, and you'll take price out, depending on what kind of consuming trends in the country at time. For example, I think a computer is now in the CPI index or an iPad or something like that, whereas it was a bit of TV scale. Tape decks would have been or DVR video records. Now we have DVDs, but we have Netflix subscription and going to the supply. So, what can be computed from the table? So, let's look at question A again. Elimination is probably worth doing here. So, prices fell continuously from year two to year five. We can see that although they fell to year four, between year four and year five, they increased, so the prices didn't fall continuously. Uh, prices rose between year one and year five. In year one, they were 100. In year five, they're 108. That is true. We can complete that. And now we just eliminate year two. Prices rose only from year one to year two. Yeah, we did rise then. They also rose from year four to year five. And so that can't be right. And prices were the highest in year five. They were 108. It's pretty high. And in year two, they were 110. So they weren't at the highest in year five. Therefore, B is the only one we can actually conclude from this table. Okay, let's couple of questions. 27. A Japanese company built a factory in the UK to supply both the UK market and the market for the rest of Europe. What is likely to be the long run impact on the UK's balance of trade and goods? So, we're likely to see the UK's balance of trade and goods, they're likely to export more. But what the current account balance is going to be is a little bit more complicated, simply because it relies on us understanding uh, the current account, uh, what the current account is, it's difficult between nation saving and investment. And uh, it's defined as the sum of the balance of trade and goods and services, and the income from abroad, and their current transfers. And we're unclear, we don't have enough information from this to really understand what's going to happen with the balance of payments, because it's made up too many components. Although building a factory in the UK is in company investments, and 
we can see that they're going to export goods to the rest of Europe from the UK. And we're likely to see an improvement in balance of traded goods, which is we're exporting more goods than we were previously doing so. Um, and we can make that conclusion. We can't actually conclude anything about the current balance of that it's important to be careful to check that you actually can make a statement. So if there's other factors that aren't talked about in the question, it's unclear and it's risky to make a conclusion about current account and therefore uncertain to the right answer. Be careful of that. Uh, question 28. Some foreign exchange markets. What would be the new equilibrium position after decreasing demand from US residents for European consumer goods? So when it, someone in the US demands a good for the UK, they demand euros, they, do, they change US dollars to euros in order to, um, sorry, they, sorry, I lost my train. They <laughs> demand euros uh, in exchange for dollars in order to buy those goods. So we see a decrease in demand for US residents. So the demand for euros is going to fall. So what we're going to see is demand shift to the left. Uh, we're therefore going to see a, in reaction to that, we would see a depreciation in the um, currency, which increases the supply of dollars. So more people are now, because they're demanding less uh, euros, they're demanding more US dollars, just so fall in the price of euros, and the economy is very prevalent to the same quantity of US dollars, C. To lower lowering the price. It's quite a complicated question, and um, relies on you understanding the way the exchange rates work in terms of appreciation depreciation, depreciations. And the easiest way to understand appreciations and depreciations is that they're simply markets. So that when you want to buy, although kind of technology has changed, changed the nature of um, changed the nature of perhaps desiring currency. Um, now, now, in reality, what happens when I'm in the US and I'm in Europe, and I demand euros, I need those currency in order to buy the dollars. So it's a simple to find the market. Okay. Question 29. Okay, now offset some changes. So here that's just saying everything remains the same. What would be likely to increase if the country's exchange rate appreciates? So under an appreciation, what happens is, uh, it's a, an appreciation is an increase in the value of one currency in terms of another, and it makes your exports more expensive and your imports cheaper. So if your currency appreciates, you're going to import a lot more, and you're going to, your exports are more expensive. So the companies working uh, in, let's say, the UK currency is depreciated, and it's depreciated, your exports are going to become more expensive, so there's less demand from abroad for your products. Uh, domestic uh, producers are struggling to uh, to export as much there for profits, etc. And it's also cheaper now to buy more abroad. So people in the UK are demanding um, goods previously that they might have bought from the UK are now finding it cheaper to buy from abroad. So at home, you can see companies in the UK are going to suffer from that. Uh, they're not exporting as much, not making as much money, and also some of their domestic uh, demand is being taken up by uh, being. So you'll probably likely see an increase in the, in the rate of unemployment. Yeah. Um, the other answer is they make as much sense. Some of them, for example, the level of inflation uh, is actually likely to uh, decrease um, because the cost of Europe is much cost push inflation, although potentially we're kind of going to be too much inflation. And the, um, the volume of manufacturing exports you're likely to see fall. Um, actually, so that's wrong. And the cost of importing consumer goods is going to fall if the currency appreciates. So actually, the rate of unemployment is the only one that's likely to increase. And actually, this is the answer. Well, the tourism here, so that's some tourism seems a good way of increasing the exports, especially luxury tourism. Uh, this kind of scenario is called tourism. So it's considered by the economy to have very pricey market demand. What does that mean? So that means that no matter how much you increase the price, demand is likely to stay the same. People don't really care about the price when they demand like this. So if that's correct, so if you change the price of these, these products, people can still demand them. What's likely to increase export revenue um, by the economy from much in tourism? So what we're looking for is an increase in the price. If price increases, uh, or if the price increases, then people don't make more money because the demand is likely to remain the same, but people are paying more for the products. So let's look down the list and depreciate it. Economy's currency going to make um, 
their uh, their exports cheaper, uh, and therefore they're not getting as much money for, for their exporting tourism holidays. Reduction the taxes levelled on hotels likely to to um, to make it cheaper to go on holiday. Uh, the hotels aren't going to have to pay as much, but it's not really going to increase export revenue. People are not going to go into more and more because the holidays are costing less because taxes are less on hotels. As though the country aren't going to make each domestic uh, supply of hotels is likely to make more money. A cheap government knows to keep the building more hotels isn't going to impact on, on demand, although they would get more money. Uh, but we're looking at specifically at export revenue, here, not profitability or, or income in the firms. Be an appreciated from this currency. The holidays are getting more expensive, exports have become more expensive, but you still have the amount of money, the same amount of people demanding it because it's very price and elastic. Therefore, an appreciation of the economy's currency, the price of holidays getting more expensive for those abroad, is going to make increased export revenue because no falling demand is, it, it occurs as a result of this increase in price. A hundred, if 100 people were demanding the holiday last year, it cost £100. And now this year it's going to cost 130, but still 100 people demanding it, or 99 people demanding it, this is very price and elastic. You're clearly going to make more money. You get more revenue, and therefore the answer is safe. Quick run through the bits of the paper. Um, I apologize uh, for any, any background noise. Um, I assure you that in, in future sessions that would be uh, limited it's the first time you'll hear from me. Um, and uh, I really look forward to, to doing all these in the future. So do write down your questions, and I look forward to answering them uh, as we go through this this process. Um, thank you very much.